have your Bibles, take those, and I'll meet you in 1 John. We're going to start our summer series uh, this morning going through the book of, well, the letter of 1 John. You'll notice on your outline that I put some blanks, some blanks. What do you know? My wife and I are big fans of the TV show Jeopardy. Anybody else? Yeah, it's just a reminder to me daily. It's a humbling thing to remind me of what I don't know. Uh, But I'm going to start each week uh, through our our series with some Bible trivia. And I'll provide you with some blanks there on your outline. So make sure you grab one of those when you come in. There's one inside the bulletins that are on the tables back there, but there's also some extra outlines as well. So I'm going to start there with those three trivia questions just to find out what you know. I don't need you to speak out loud, but I've given you some blanks. We'll go over the answers in a second. The first question is this. Who were the three sons of Adam and Eve? See, you you got that. Nice. Whoever's doing that. Nice. All right, you've got those. Second question How did Moses' mother save him from the Egyptians? Jot down your answer there. You got that one. Yeah, all right. Third question. Who was the first king of Israel? Got those? The people online are like, there's so much silence here. Well, I'm giving you time to write these down, but let's go over the answers real quick. Are you ready? First question, who were the three sons? If you wrote down Cain, Abel, and Seth. Seth is the one we often forget. All right. Second question, how did Moses' mother save him? She hid him in a basket in the river. All right. Third question, Saul. Some of you may have written down David. Don't forget about Saul right before him. So I've titled this series that you may know. John is writing a letter to people that he wants to make sure that they know certain things. In fact, the word know is mentioned 40 times in this letter of 1 John. 25 of those times, it's the Greek word gnosko. You and I get our word knowledge from there, but the other 15 are another word, oida, and I'm still trying to figure out why he chose to use two different words for our English word, no, and I'll let you know if I discover anything there, but 40 times it's mentioned that you may know these things, and so uh, I've titled this series that you may know, and I hope that as we walk through this letter together that we might be reminded of things that we need to know. And maybe there might be some things that I didn't know that, but I need to know that. And so we will work our way through that. But before we go to 1 John, I want to spend the remainder of today's time providing an overview to two of the four books that I would say are the most neglected books in the New Testament. 2 John, 3 John, Jude and Philemon. They just get neglected. I mean, we've read, we've read them, right? We've read through the New Testament. We've read through the Bible. And I hope you're keeping up with our churches reading through the Bible in a year. We're, we're, we're doing that together. Hopefully you're keeping up. There's, the plan is out there on the table. Grab that if you need it and pick up today and just start today. But let's read together. But I would say that 2 John and 3 John, though we've read them, could you really, do you really know anything about them? Could you, if someone walked up to you and said, hey man, will you tell me what 3 John is all about? Could you tell them? So today, I want to provide just an overview before we get to 1 John next week. I'll, today will serve as an intro to our series that we're coming to. So 2 John and 3 John. This small little book, 2 John, made up of 245 Greek words, make it the second shortest book in the New Testament. I'm going to keep saying book, but I mean to say letter. It's hard to say it's a book because it's a page long in my Bible. might be a page and flip to the other side in yours, but it's a page, 
245 words. Third John, 219 words, which make it the shortest of the letters or books in the New Testament. It's estimated that it was written between the year 85 and 80 and 95 AD. Church historian Eusebius suggests that, that it was written, second and third John were written after John was released from the island of Patmos where he was exiled and it was there that he wrote the book of Revelation. John's got a lot of ink in the New Testament. Uh, his gospel account, first, second, and third John, and the book of Revelation. If Eusebius is correct in his timing of its writing, it would make second and third John the last documents written in the New Testament. So these are uh, written late in the first century. So we get to second John. It's in brief, John is dealing with teachers, preachers that have gone out from the church. Uh, you and I, early on, early in the, in the 20th century, uh, we had what we called circuit pastors. They would travel around from church to church, and, and they would preach at these different churches. Uh, where do they stay when they get to those different towns? John's dealing with something very similar to that in these two little short letters. These traveling preachers. What do we do with them? Because what you and I know as, as a hotel or a motel, didn't, that would have been totally unfamiliar to first century readers. Now they had inns. They had, they had motel type things. Hey, listen, Joseph and Mary made their way to Bethlehem and there was no room for them in the inn. So, so it was familiar, but here's the deal about those inns. They were often extremely dirty and flea infested. Innkeepers, the, the men that ran these things, had the same reputation, dirty and flea infested. So that it was, it was no place, it would, it would be natural for these traveling preachers to expect that the church family in these different places where they go to preach would show them hospitality and bring them in. Makes sense. We get that. W. M. Ramsey, he says this, the ancient hotels were little removed from house of ill fame. The profession of the innkeeper was dishonorable and their infamous character is often noted in Roman law. Listen, it was no place uh, for these traveling preachers to stay. So John is writing a letter to the early church, the churches that he was ministering to, and telling them in 2 John, don't receive false teachers. In 3 John, he's dealing with the same topic, but he's saying you do need to receive the right teachers. So he's dealing with these things uh, in these two short little letters that he writes. And it is with that in mind, the reception or not receiving of these traveling missionaries that we need to read and understand second and third John. Important for us to do that. If a missionary comes to town with the right message and the right motives, then we should receive them. If they don't, we should not. John's reading that. Well, check, look, look at it with me. In 2 John, verse 7. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. That's the wrong message. 3 John, flip over a page, verse 7. For they have gone out for the sake of the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. That's the right motive. They're not going out to try to fill up their own pockets. They're not going out for their own fame, for the sake of their own name. They're going out for the sake of Jesus' name. They have the right motive. Look at 3 John verse 6 and then down to verse 8. Uh, he, he's speaking to them who testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. Go down to verse 8. Therefore, we ought to support people like these. 
that we may be fellow workers in the truth. Third John is talking about receiving those teachers, those missionaries that have the right message and the right motives. Second John is he's addressing the issue of not receiving those with the wrong message or wrong motives. It's, a, it's important that we see that as we read these two little books. Because guys, listen, when we walk out of here today, if someone were to walk up to you and ask you, hey, what's Second John all about? You'd be able to give it to them. What do you know? I want to make sure you know. That's why I've titled this series, That You May Know. And these two little letters, I'm just suggesting, are often neglected. Though we read them, we just don't know much about them. And I want to make sure we leave today knowing what these two little letters are about, what it's about. Some, there's some themes that I want to point out as well. And then I want to read the letter to you. One of the themes is repeated words. For example, the word truth is mentioned five times in verses one through four. Guys, we need to listen. We need to recognize and take note of words that are repeated. Truth is mentioned five times. The word love is mentioned four times in verses one through six. The word command is mentioned four times in verses four through six. Walk or the form of that word, three times in verses four through six. Teaching mentioned three times. So one of the things that I want us to notice are these repeated words when we read through this small letter. Another theme that is present in this this letter is the commands that are given. I want to point them out to you. Verses five and six of 2 John. And now we ask, dear lady, he's he's writing to the church. Look up back up in verse one before I get there. The elder, scholars would say that's John, to the elect body, the church, and her children. Joel, why doesn't he just say to the church? Oftentimes when these letters that were being passed around and with all the persecution that was out there, oftentimes they would use, we'll call it code language, uh, so that these letters didn't get taken and torn up. So he uses this language. So back to uh, the commands that, that were given in this letter, verses five and six. And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing to you a new commandment, but the one we had from the beginning, that we love one another. There's the message, that we love one another. It's a command. Another one, verse eight, watch yourself. It's an imperative. He's not asking us, he's telling us, watch yourself. Look out for false teachers. Verse 8, watch yourself so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. And verse 10 is another command to watch out for false teachers. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. Those are imperative verbs. Not asking you, I'm telling you. There are people out there that are trying to deceive. Listen, they may be one degree off from the truth, but it's not the truth. One degree off from from where I'm standing, from the middle of this table, one degree off, 10 feet from here, you might not be able to tell. One degree off a mile from here, you could probably notice it. One degree off 100 miles from here, you would definitely see it. Hey, John's saying, man, listen, they need to be bringing the truth, the truth of this message that we've had from the beginning. Make sure you watch out for that. There's also some contrasts that are mentioned throughout this this second John that he brings into view. Verse four, those who walk in the truth versus verse seven, those who deny the truth. So there's some contrasts that are being painted in this little letter. This is a beautiful little letter that I hope we won't neglect from now on. When you stop and read 2nd and 3rd John, give it some thought. But I I want you to know, man, we need to be able to walk away and say, I know what 2nd John's about. He's saying, man, people need to have the right message and the right motive before the church body gives them a platform to do their ministry from. We We need to be careful. Another contrast, the command from the command from the beginning in verses five and six we just read, versus those who go beyond, those who uh, add to 
the message we've had from the beginning. Those who, who step outside of the message we've had from the beginning. There's a contrast painted there. A deeds of worthy of full reward, verse 8, versus evil deeds, verse 11. Those who reject the Antichrist, verse 10, and those who receive the Antichrist, verse 11. So there's some, some themes that I've just mentioned that I want us to keep our eyes peeled for as we read this little letter. This is a longer reading than I usually do, but let's read the letter because I want you to know. Second John. The elder, of the, the elder to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, not only I, but all who know the truth. Because of the truth that abides in us and will be with us forever, grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son in truth and love. You see the repetition of, of these words. I rejoice greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we were commanded by the Father. And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but, but the one we had from the beginning, that we may love one another. And this, and this is love, that we, are walk, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment just as you have heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. And guys, let me, let me mention this on, on walking real quick. He's talking about habitual behavior in how we live. All those yous that you, you have heard that, so that you should walk in, those are, uh, if I could put it in Texas language, y'all. Second person plural, that y'all walk in it. He's talking to the church that you walk, that it be a habitual behavior of your life that people would just see. That's how you walk in truth and in love. And friends, that is a good word for me and you. To sit back and think about my life. Do I walk in truth, in love? Is my life guided constantly, not just on Sundays and not just on when I go to life group? Is my life constantly grounded and influenced by the truth? And do people see love in my life? Am I a loving person? Or, or is my reputation, well, we'll get to reputation here in a few minutes, but let me get back to reading before I lose completely where I am. Verse seven. For many deceivers have gone out into the world. Those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh, such a one is, a, is the deceiver and the Antichrist. Watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have, what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive them into your house or give them any greeting. For whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. Though I have much to write to you, I would rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come to you and talk face to face so that, your, so that our joy may be complete. The children of your elect sister greet you. Joel, I, I don't know that... I have any application. I don't, where, what application can we take away from 2 John? He's talking to a, a church receiving, not receiving, those that don't have the right message and right motives. I have some takeaways that I want us to take away from 2 John. The first one is this. First application is that truth has a source, and it has companions that go along with it. Look with me back in verse 2 and 3. Because of the truth that abides in us and will be with us forever. I, now, underline that on the back of your outline as I've printed out 2 John and 3 John. Underline it. It'll be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace are companions for truth. They go along with it. 
This, this comes from knowing the one who calls himself truth. He said, I am, you can say it with me, I am the, the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If anyone comes to you with a message other than that, don't welcome them in. Don't bring them in. Don't even extend a greeting to them. Joel, that sounds contradictory to this idea of loving, loving one another and, and even loving our enemies. John understood that there is a grave danger in these false teachers. Though they may be one degree off, it is still not the truth. And they are not to be welcomed. Grace, what is grace? Do you know? What do you know? Grace. It's God doing for us what we don't deserve. Thank God for his grace. Sending his son Jesus to pay the price for my sin and your sin. Thank God for his grace. Mercy, what is mercy? What do you know? Do you know it? Mercy is God not doing to us what we deserve. Thank God for his mercy because every single one of us deserve punishment. We deserve it. We have turned our back on God. We have sinned, we have messed up. We have stepped away from God's righteous plan. Thank God for his mercy, peace, simply referring to to personal wholeness and well-being in all aspects of life. David mentioned a peace that passes all understanding. It has a source, and the source is truth. His name is Jesus. I I need us to know that. It's important that we have that locked away. It's amazing to me in our society today, how everyone has their own truth. Whether you're on this side of the aisle or on that side of the aisle, they both have their truth. And they are both presenting as convincing of arguments as they possibly can of what the truth is. Church, we will be a people that declare scripture, God's holy ancient word as our truth. We are not going to interpret what's being said out there. Let me put it the other way. We are going to interpret what's being said out there through the lens of Scripture. Does that make sense? We can't do it the other way. And I'm afraid there are a lot of people sitting in churches today that they view everything. They view Scripture through what society is teaching. We can't do it. We're going to be people of the truth. That's why every week I say, if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do. Friends, I hope you have your Bible. I hope you're marking it up. I hope you're taking notes. You're learning day in and day out the truth. The truth has a source, and it has companions. Grace, mercy, and peace. He says, many deceivers have gone out that do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Another application is to pay pay close attention to what you believe. These deceivers are after you. If they can get you off one degree, they won. We need to pay close attention to what we believe. There are many faith groups out there that have creeds. Uh, We even sing one of them. Uh, I believe in God, the Father, maker of heaven. A creed. It just lays down these core foundational beliefs that we have. We are not a creedal people, but we do have a document that states and lays down what we believe. It's called the Baptist Faith and Message 2000. And, And you can go to our website and find our beliefs. I believe that's important information for everyone to know. What we believe about God what we believe about Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, church, salvation, uh, the core foundational beliefs. You need to be sure you know what you believe and be careful with what you believe. You know, at least it's my understanding that the way that they treat law enforcement agents to recognize fake money is by showing them and just 
pouring into their mind and their vision of what real money looks like. They don't teach them to recognize fake money by showing them fake money. They teach them to recognize fake by showing them real over and over and over so that when a fake document comes in, that ain't it. I've seen the truth, I know the truth, I know what it looks like, and that's not it. You and I need to be careful and pay close attention to what we believe. And the only way we will know, the only way we will be able to recognize false teaching, because he's talking about false teachers here, is by knowing the truth. Stay in the word. Be in the word. Joel, I've been, I've, I've, life's been crazy lately. I've, I've been out of... I've been out of uh, rhythm with being in God's word. Start today. Maybe that's your takeaway today is that I need to get back into my routine. I need to make sure I put it in my calendar. I'm going to get a notification every day to be in God's word. It has just, it's, it's, I've lost it in my routine. And today's the day that we reset that. The only way you and I will be able to notice and spot false teaching is if we know the truth. Let's stay there and stay in it. Another application from Second John is knowing false by knowing what is true. I just covered that, just got out of my notes. I pointed out a few years ago, and I think it's worth pointing out today, the mathematics of cults. The mathematics of cults. How to spot a cult. Here we go, you ready? The first mathematic formula that they do is addition. They add two, they add extra biblical sources and give them the authority that scripture has. Addition. If there's some other extra biblical document that they're adding or they're giving authority to, be on alert. Another part of the mathematical formulation of a cult is subtraction. They take away from who the person of Jesus is, the work of Jesus on the cross. They don't think that his work on the cross, his completed work of death, burial, and resurrection was enough. They take away from the personhood and the work of Jesus. Subtraction. Another part of the formula is division. They try to divide your allegiance to the Bible to another person as well, with another person. You can be devoted to both, my next door neighbors. Some of the most loving people I know. Because up here in verse, verse one, in truth and love, they go together. I mean, it's like a jersey for a Christian. If I were to wear a Denver Bronco jersey up here, which I wish I could sometimes, but it's been tough lately. It would identify that I'm a fan of the Denver Broncos. Here's the deal. Truth and love, that's our jersey. People can recognize us by people that walk in the truth, and we have, we're loving people. So I come back to that issue of reputation. What is your reputation at work? What's your reputation at school, students? Are you known for walking in the truth? Are you known for being a loving person? Oh, I don't, it terrifies me to have the thought that one of my students when I was in student ministry said to me, Joel, I love my parents so much more on Sundays when we come to church. Because all the other times, they're mean. They don't live anything like that. But boy, we come to church and they're the sweetest people I know. I love my parents so much more. What's your reputation at home? What's your reputation with your neighbors? Do they know you to be loving? Oh, I know my next door neighbors to be loving. But they're not walking in the truth. I pray that God would continue to, would, would open up doors for us to have conversations. And we've had some already about the truth. They've added extra biblical material and have given it the authority of scripture. 
So John is saying, Joel, you should not allow them to use your house as a platform to do their ministry. You should not allow them, Joel, to use your house to do a Bible study for their Mormon faith. What's your reputation? Now, I want to let that breathe for a little bit. Because today could be the day that God's saying, let's work on that. I, I need you to be more loving with your coworkers. Hmm. The last part of the mathematical po- equation is multiplication. They multiply the, the requirements for salvation. Yeah, God, what Jesus did on the cross was great, but it wasn't enough. You need, to, you need to do some works. You need to do these things to help finish, seal the deal. Be careful when you notice those things. Second John, don't receive those people that don't have the right message or the right motives. Third John, same topic, other side of the coin. Second John, he writes to the church. Third John, he writes to a person, Gaius, a leader in the church. He walked in the truth. You can see that in his introduction there. Served others and the Lord faithfully. He mentions three people in this short little letter. Gaius, Diotrephus, a man that had, was full of pride, prideful ambition, verse 9, arrogance, a spreader of nonsense, and, and wants to put people out of the church that are willing to receive and greet and house missionaries with the right message and right motives. Diotroph- Diotrophus did not want to receive them, and anyone in the church who wanted to receive them, he wanted to even kick them out of the church. So John is dealing with the other side of the coin. Second John, don't receive bad message, bad motives, but do receive those with the right motives, right message. Diotrophus is one that was keeping that from happening. Demetrius provides a godly example of living and had a strong testimony. You can see that as you read there. John takes 219 words and gives us a strong, passionate letter to take care of those missionaries. We have missionaries that come through town every once in a while. Our friends from Europe who are making films over there. We need to receive them, take care of them, bless them in any ways that we can. Our reputations ought to reflect love and truth with those around us. And we need to make sure that we are walking in the truth. I have a self-portrait, not a self-portrait, but a portrait of me that was painted or drawn by one of the artists of Walt Disney Studios when I was in the eighth grade, lived in Pasadena, California. My mom asked this guy, he went to our church, Brian Jowers, to do a portrait of all four of the children. Anna, I don't know if you still have yours. You don't have one? (laughs) <laughs> I got one. Sorry, had a family moment there. <clears throat> and at the bottom of this portrait is verse 4, your memory verse this week, out of Third John. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. And I share John's sentiment. It fills my heart with joy when I hear stories about a block party and someone coming and saying they have a desire to be close to Jesus and people handling them with tender gloves, appropriate gloves, looking to share the truth. As I'm telling you, that fills me up hearing that our church body is a people of truth and walking in it, it is an Discipline that happens over and over and over. So our reputation. I quote and close with this, what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16. 
In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to the Father who is in heaven. Church, let's live that way. Be on high alert for false teachers. And the way to do that is to be in the word. Stay in it. Walk in it. Day in and day out. We are now ready with that little intro to go to the book of First John and spend our summer there. But I want you to know about Second and Third John. Great little letters. Great little letters. Let's pray. Father, we do ask that we would be known for truth and love. And today, if there are course corrections that we need to make in our lives, I pray that you would point, it, point to us, help us see it. It might be a blind spot in our life. Help us see it, Lord. And then give us the discipline. Give us the courage to make those corrections. Father, I pray that uh, our reputations... In, at work, uh, even in the church body, in our homes, in our neighborhoods, would be of truth and love. I pray that each one of us would, would stop and reflect. Lord, we would even ask, invite you to come and help us to consider our reputation. And what do you want to do in us today? Help us to be on high alert for false teaching. Give us strength and, and discipline to daily be in your word so that we can know the truth and be able to easily spot false teaching. I pray for the churches in our community that are teaching Jesus, that you would give us influence, that we would have the opportunity to connect our church and community to become change agents for you. Lord, we want your fame. We want your name to be growing, becoming more famous in our community. So Lord, we love you, we praise you, and we give you this day. In Jesus' name.